Hey guys, what's up? It is week 212. Is it 212? I think it's 212. So to start this off, I'll let you guys know that the Santa Sangre contest is still going on. All you have to do to enter is send an email to ScreamingToiletContest at gmail.com and in the title put a uh, contest and you'll be entered um, to win this bad boy. You can be from overseas. I will send it. But remind you, you'll probably get some advertisements for you know upcoming releases from MVD and some sales and stuff like that. This thing is loaded. I've talked about this before. I covered this uh, a couple weeks back and then I kind of opened it up and showed everybody for the, uh, you know, the contest and everything. It's still sealed. It's loaded with features. It's an excellent movie. Movie. The 4K looks great. Alejandro Jodorowsky is one of the greatest directors of all time when it comes to cult cinema. So, yeah, if you've not seen this or you want to upgrade, definitely enter the contest. Highly recommended release. It comes with a 4K, a Blu-ray, um, a Blu-ray of supplemental material, and the soundtrack, of course, which is a great soundtrack. So let's get into the reviews. And the first one up is a doozy. This is for Mondo Macabro, and this is Hunting Ground. It has an AKA name. I want to say it's like Code of Honor or something along those lines. So I said this is 1983. If you guys aren't familiar with Jorge Grau, the director, he did a handful of other kind of cult titles, uh, one of which is the most famous is, of course, Let Sleeping Corpses Lie from 1974, which is a Spanish-Italian co-production, ended up on the Video Nasties list, and it happens to be one of my all-time favorite uh, horror films. Uh, Besides that, uh, there's also uh, Blood Ceremony, which Code Red put out, and it's also a really great movie about Elizabeth Batori, uh, made around the same time as Hammer's version, uh, Countess Dracula. Both are great. I would recommend checking out Blood Ceremony. I was very impressed with it and, and the released gothic horror movie. He also did uh, Violent Bloodbath, which I have not got a chance to see, and a handful of other uh, films, which are less interesting to genre fans. This one is kind of like the big genre film that he released that was kind of hard to find. It was always categorized to me as a rape revenge film, so I uh, definitely imagine it being kind of a really um, brutal and raunchy exploitation rape film. But I should have known better because Jorge Grau's films, they usually have like a sense of intelligence about them and some meaningful stuff in there. If you look at Let's Sleepy Corpses Lie, you have some environmental stuff, and Blood Ceremony has that kind of age, you're being scared to get old and everything like that. Uh, so, so I love that too, um, how, how people are kind of just thrown away when they're older, and particular women for their you know the looks and everything and, and that kind of thing i thought they explored that really well so when uh hunting ground opened up i was like okay we're gonna have your typical death with ca death wish cap uh cash in you're gonna have the kind of standard uh, ultra liberal person uh sees the error of her ways and has to get revenge in a, a violent brutal way you know think hills have eyes where the most meek become the most monstrous just to survive in this terrible world of you know cruelty and survival which I love those kind of 70s movies, don't get me wrong. Um, and Death Wish, I'm a big fan of that, and the series, and all those kind of things like that. So when this started off, the lead character in this film, the actress, uh, the mother, she has a kid, she, her husband's a doctor, they're very successful, they're very well off, and like you would see her as kind of like an elitist, very um, bleeding heart type. She is a defense attorney, and she spent her entire career defending kind of criminals, and she looks at them as people who just never had another way of life, and that's what they turn to crime, and they're misunderstood, and they're also victims of, you know, society, victims of their circumstances, and everything like that. So um, one day, a, a group of uh, criminals kind of, they steal her car. And uh, she's, she kind of, uh, they, they like abandoned it, but they get access to all her like private documents and stuff like that, her cases and other things like that, and where their, their summer home is, their summer cottage. So um, one night, the group um, are at the summer cottage and there's kind of a, a they miscommunication. The, the people are staying there, but they left and they're coming back. And of course, they run into the criminals. And the criminals here, there's like four of them, which are kind of the main criminals. A pair of brothers who, uh, which they really tied it into their mother too. And there's a great scene where there's a mother to mother confrontation. And I was like, oh man, I would just be losing my mind if I was the, the main character right here. But she comes from that, that background, so it makes things really complicated. And I legitimately thought this movie was going to go full exploitation to the point where it was just like, uh, you know, her covered in blood, her being excessively raped repeatedly and just going out and getting revenge. And the movie is so much more thoughtful than that and uh, well thought out and like I said, well thought out and thoughtful, double there, but just a little bit more... Um, 
uh, I'm going to say complicated and thought provoking too. I was thinking, man, this is really handling it way better than I expected. Like everything is set up with the, the young son with the guns and the, and the father and the, the home videos. Like I don't want to spoil too much here, but the bad guys are, are pretty ruthless, especially the lead bad guy. He comes from, he's cut from the same kind of cloth as like a Krug from Last House on the Left or a Don Stroud from um, Death Weekend. One of these kind of guys, it's just like a 70s heavy, even though he's from 83. Um, not as strong as a David Hess, which no one ever was when it comes to that kind of role, or a Don Stroud even, but he is very, very uh, effective and just a, an asshole. And and when the ending of the film finally comes to, and we see you know what's kind of inevitable in this film, I thought it worked really well, and I thought it handled it in, in, in a good way. And I was really happy with it. Um, there is some brutal stuff in here, though. They do show full frontal nudity, uh, male and female. Uh, and I didn't expect to see some of that stuff. So, uh, yeah, I think Jorge Grau had a little bit more freedom when it came to that kind of stuff than his earlier films. Because the whole, you know, um, they always bring this up with, you know, Franco rule and stuff. And then you can kind of tell when his rule uh, kind of wore off and the movies just got way more sexually explicit and all that kind of stuff. So um, at the end, it, it does have these brutal moments and, and, and it was really um, um, fulfilling. Uh, I know like a lot of people watch these movies for that, uh, you know, that cathartic moment of revenge or, or justice in quotations, we'll say, but it really worked well here. And this is a movie that has pretty much never had a release in the States as far as I know. I don't think there was ever a DVD or I know there wasn't a DVD and I'm pretty sure there wasn't a VHS. They wouldn't release it in Spanish and there's no English. There is an English dub. Sorry. Um, I, I watched some of it in English dub just to see how it is. I like to watch my Euro horror in usually English just because I'm so used to that kind of no sound. Down, um, recording, but this one I went with the Spanish because the tone of the film suggested that it's a little bit more of a serious kind of deal. And and though a lot of the times with the Italian films, the actors are speaking their native language here, it felt like everybody was speaking Spanish. So I felt it would be better to watch it in Spanish. And I feel like I was right, so I watched the Spanish. Um, yeah, this is also a Christmas film, which adds another layer uh, in there. And there's a there's a really great moment between um, the main character. Um, and her mother-in-law and uh, the son's hearing and it's just like a lot of complexities and stuff and just well handled uh, and, and and also has that brutality like I said it has these messages in here but he does deliver the goods when it comes to that kind of exploitative feel too um, so Hunting Ground great movie great release it looked really good it sounded pretty good I did notice that there was a weird kind of uh, jarring kind of look to it at one moment towards the end of the film and knowing that this movie is fairly lost, it just um, it was a split second when the bad guys were attacking and grabbing her. I, I noticed some like weird kind of look to it, and I don't know exactly how to explain it. And I feel like it's probably just the elements, because this never really had a release, so I can't compare it to any other releases out there. You know, kind of like the red line in Dawn of the Dead when Roger uh, um, walks up and shoots a zombie in the cellar. There's always that red line through the film, and every version I've ever seen of that movie had it. So I like I can't compare it to this if that that's something wrong with the element or the the Blu-ray or something like that. But I the Blu-ray played almost seamlessly, except it, it just had that one little second that looked off to me towards the end, and I probably think it's the elements. Um, there is features on here uh, which I. I, I checked out a little bit. There was a 50 minute interview with Jorge Grau, um, which I really liked listening to. I, I kind of like went through some of it. And um, when he gets into Let's Live Me Corpses Lie, he recounts the story of uh, Amadi again, talking about Night of the Living Dead, which is a lovely story. I always love hearing that story about you want to make Night of the Living Dead in color. And you're like, yeah, <laughs> that's a great story. But he also talks a little bit about some of his other films, including Blood Ceremony and Violent Bloodbath, and of course, this one. So um, he even mentions that they wanted him to kind of make the ending uh, kind of more, um, you know, clear cut. But um, he kind of fought it, and I think he made the right decision for the character. Um, but yeah, it, it's a good movie that you think is going to be very straightforward and generic, but it's way more thought-provoking than one would expect. It's a close to an hour and like 48-minute movie, so it's a little bit more character development than one would expect um, and drama. But it's still well worth your time. Very good movie and a very good get for Code Red because this is a movie that had been on my radar and my bucket list to see for a decade at least. And it just never had a nice release except bootlegs. And finally, we get to see it in 
in HD, which is great. So hopefully we get some more Spanish films coming out. We have been getting a slew of them, and I've been happy to check them out because I've seen a lot of Italian films, and they're my favorite. So um, a lot of the Spanish films are very similar to that kind of feel, so I'm very happy to be watching some of them as well. Okay, this next one is also for Mondo Macabro, and this is... Uh, Paul Nashi film. This is The Howl of the Devil. Um, yeah, this is, I guess it's not really considered one of the um, the werewolf films he made, although Paul Nashi does appear as a werewolf. This is a really bizarre movie. Another one that was fairly lost. Like, there was bootlegs and shitty elements, but finally we get it in HD. It's 1988, so it's a little later than a lot of his other films, but boy, oh boy, was this a treat. It opens up saying it's a, a dedicated to Bela Lugosi, Boris Karloff, Lon Chaney, and Jack Pierce, the special effects artist who made all those great, a lot of the great makeups, not Lon Chaney stuff, but you know, a lot of the great makeups on Lon Chaney Jr. and Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi come to life in those films. So he's going to like not mention as much as a lot of the other special effects artists, but he pretty much kind of made those great looks that we love, you know, bolt on Frankenstein's necks, that kind of stuff. So anyways, it's dedicated to them. And Paul Nash, he is such an interesting person, to be honest. Um, he's such an interesting kind of look into one of these horror guys. Like, I believe, from my understanding, he was never as popular in Spain as he should have been. And in America, he had more appreciation. I mean, the guy has played um, the, the a werewolf um, like nine times, maybe more, maybe 12 times, as this Valdemar uh, Denzinski uh, character who is in a bunch of these werewolf films. Uh, Mondo actually put out another one, The Beast with the Magic Sword, which is an insane movie, um, recommended. And he's played a vampire. He's played um, a slew of creatures, hunchbacks. But in this one, he... It felt like he sat down and thought. Um, he always plays dual roles. And you got to think that he has to have some sort of like ego on him, of course, to play all this and put himself there. But at the same time, there is such a tremendous love for the source material and the original monsters that you can see coming through that I just kind of adore it. I kind of love it. And um, then I love Nashi through that. Um, so it's just really interesting. So uh, basically, I, I before I explain what this movie is about, Nashi, I felt like, was looking at the checklist of monsters and characters he played, and he's like, well, have I ever played the Phantom? I don't know. We're going to get the Phantom in there. Have I ever played um, Mr. Hyde? I don't, I'm not so sure. Let's get Mr. Hyde. Let's get Frankenstein in there. Let's get, of course, the werewolf again, and let's get, you know, a hunchback. So... Okay, the plot of this film is very bizarre. We have this um, theater actor, played by Nashi, who is kind of a failed theater actor. He's very classically trained, if you will not. Um, and he is a recluse. He lives in this mansion, and he has a, a vice, of course, beautiful young women. that he's, he's got a sexual, you know, appetite, a very sexual appetite, and he needs to have certain kinks to get it off. He needs to dress in these kind of old-school characters like Bluebeard and um, Fu Manchu. So kind of crazy shit like that starts to happen as well. And even Rasputin. Uh, so, yeah, he has all these weird kind of kinks about him. And his brother was basically a Paul Nashy type who had committed suicide. And he was world kind of famous for being like this kind of guy who played horror characters like Dracula and Frank Zane the Werewolf and stuff like that. So, um, we have this kind of dual thing going on with Nashy. That character was also Nashy. We see the photos. So, uh, Nashy, the actor, his son has to live with uh, the perverted uncle. And he also has Carolyn Monroe there, who's kind of like a, um, a cook and a maid there, and Howard Vernon is also in the film as a butler, so they're like, we're just going to fill this with, you know, some horror kind of icons in here, and uh, of course people start to get picked off, there is a priest involved who, oh geez, he's in Sleeping Corpses Lie, um, that priest, and there's a homeless man that's working for the priest that's kind of lingering around this big mansion, and women start to turn up there, and they have sex with Nashi, and they end up murdered um, in gory detail, their guts, they're disemboweled, their throats are slit so we really don't know who the killer is uh, we have all these kind of strange characters wandering around the mansion but the young boy is obviously upset with his uncle and he is constantly fantasizing um, about these monsters coming to visit them um, of course played by Paul Nashi his father so he has these friends with Frankenstein's monster showing up and Mr. Hyde and it's really fun and there's a really great moment where the Phantom shows up which I absolutely loved and he shows him his face so you think that uh, it, it gets really bizarre um, and Howard Vernon has something going on as he always does you never trust Howard Vernon right like 
It just uh, every time I like um, we made a joke about this in podcast under the stairs. We did the um, forgotten jelly sets. If you guys are interested in that, and Howard Vernon was in one of the movies, and I had not seen it, and I said he's the killer. Howard Vernon's the killer. He's got to be right off the bat because I just am not trusting Howard Vernon. All right, made famous in all the Just Franco films and a slew of others. So yeah, it's just got a, a wide variety of weird characters. Carolyn Monroe looks great in this movie. Nash, he's really good in like 30 different roles, okay? And it, it's gory and weird and the music's great and the atmosphere is really fun and the ending is bonkers and insane and I love it. Um, there is a really wonderful moment within the first 5-10 minutes of this movie where um, um, what I think is a sex worker or a prostitute gets in the car with Howard Vernon and she says, I quote, you look like trustworthy. You look like a trustworthy guy, and I was like, "In what fucking world do we live in where Howard Vernon looks like a trustworthy guy? The only guy who looks more untrustworthy than him is Peter Lorre." Okay, <laughs> so I was just like, what? I just started laughing. But uh, anyways, really entertaining movie. It looks excellent. It looks great. The bum in the film is absolutely fantastic too. Just in this weird kind of semi comedic performance, but he's just, I know what evil is. Mean, it's just nuts and just like your typical. Like, I'm bummed that Peter Jackson would put in a movie just wandering in the background. You know how Peter Jackson always has, like, the stereotypical hobo guy who's constantly drunk. It, this is a, this is a, another character like that, except with dialogue. Um, there's some features on here uh, as well. Let me check those out for you guys. There is um, an interview with Sergio Molina, audio commentary from the Nashi cast, which they kind of talk a little bit about this movie, and the making of featurette. So this movie, um, from my understanding, to listening to some of that Nashi cast, was that um, it didn't really really have like a good release and Nashi was upset with the producers and they also point out some interesting stuff that um, in 1988 Nashi himself was possibly suicidal so that's very strange that uh, the Nashi character in the movie had killed himself and anyways just a, a bonkers gothic wild movie and late in the cycle but sometimes I've noticed like a lot of these movies like made in the late 80s early 90s in Euro Euro horror actually are some of the craziest. They're either going to be the best or the worst. And this one, I would lean more towards being the best. Like I really enjoyed it. I would recommend it wholeheartedly. Um, just really fun stuff. And this is not the only Nashi movie that I'll be covering this week, thankfully. So, uh, I, uh, Nashi's a guy that is, is like, Oh, I like everything I've seen him in. So I need to watch more. And then I just never get around to it. Uh, this time I did. So yeah, Howl of the devil, great title, great movie. Very cool. All right, this next one is from Cult Epics, and this is A Woman Like Eve. This is a Dutch film. This is the second in a trilogy, I believe. The first being, oh, geez, what was it called? I, I, the third one is The Cool Lakes of Death, which I'll be covering next week. Um, so all three of these movies, I covered the other one a, a couple weeks back, and it, it was some really heavy subject matter, and it was a very good film. Um, this one is more focusing, um, it's a little bit more approachable subject matter, maybe not for the time, but uh, it follows this kind of bored housewife in the very beginning of the movie. Like, she's longing, clearly longing, clearly something missing in her life. She is, you know, she stays at home and takes care of the kids while the husband goes off to work and everything like that. And she's very obviously underappreciated. She kind of wanders out and looks at the skyline. And you get that, that feeling with the music and the melancholy stuff going on that she longs for something. Something's missing in her life. One day, um, she has a mental break and uh, kind of just, just threw with it. Her husband, um, who see, is a very... Um, gray area character like you see aspects about him where you're like oh he's not so bad and then you're like oh what an awful person um a, a two a, a very kind of well-painted two-dimensional character i'll say so she goes off with her best friend on holiday and they're having a great time and she kind of runs into this young girl while swimming not younger she's a young woman swimming and they invite her her and her friend back to like this kind of i would say hippie commune where they kind of live off the land and work and, and have like this whole kind of thing going on there so she's like the complete uh counterculture to what she's used to you know this kind of whole uh patriarchal society that she's been involved with and she's obviously uh, attracted to this this young woman so they kind of start this friendship that obviously blossoms into something else and uh, uh the main character here is is really having trouble, you know, kind of deciding what she wants to do. And when everything comes to fruition with her husband, things kind of blow up. So we have custody battles and all that kind of stuff. Um, really great performance from the lead. And I'm sure um, you, you really feel sorry for her at, at times. And you really kind of is the only character I really sided with. And unfortunately, you know, it's just, it's just like a crazy situation here where her like lover, it, it, at times you're like, well, she doesn't really want to be a fo focus with the children and, and it just complicates things and grays things. And the very ending of the movie leaves it kind of open in a way like, uh, 
you know, it just can't be decided so simply and things are complicated. And I, it's just like, I don't know what the hell I would do. It's just a rough situation. Um, and, and there's points where the husband here just completely snaps. Um, it, it's a smart movie, obviously made before it's time, obviously tackling issues that a lot of people wouldn't want to talk about or wouldn't want to hear. And a lot of, uh, kind of hatred moments in here. Like one of the characters, like uh, a neighbor won't talk to her after everything that's come out. And, and it's just tough because the kids are involved. So it changes everything. Like it, it just makes things way more complicated. Um, it, it's a sad movie. Uh, but it, it says some things like all the, all so far, both the, her movies have been complex and bring up a lot of questions and not everything is painted in such a, a, a white and black kind of thing. It's painted as a real life kind of drama. And I think that they're heavy films. It has the same kind of look to it, the same kind of quality as the previous film that she had. And I just think that she shoots these very well. Um, to be honest, geez. And, and the actresses and actresses, actors, the, the entire performances in here are, are top notch. It's driving me absolutely insane that I cannot think of the other film that she directed. It literally is killing me. Um, and I do not understand why I completely forgot the title. It's completely unacceptable, to be honest. Um, but it happens. The debut. There we go. I literally had the cheat. But the debut uh, is a great, uh, you know, debut film. And this one is another good one that sits right in. I think I prefer the debut a little bit because I was just kind of shocked how they handled the subject matter. And this one, I think that it's kind of been done. Um, it's more accepted and just more explored as a film, if that makes sense. The subject matter of the lesbianism and stuff like that and the relationship stuff, it's not as taboo as something like the debut is. And Cool uh, Lakes of Death, I think, is more oriented in the horror kind of thriller category, which I'm kind of curious to see because uh, her films do have like a certain kind of quality to them where they're not horror films, but they're definitely genre films. And I, I don't know how to explain like art films. So, so I feel like people that are into those kind of movies would be interested in this as well. Um, as far as the features are concerned, we have an interview with uh, the director by journalist uh, Flor T. Smith at I Film Museum in 2020. It is 40 minutes long. And then we have some poster and photo galleries and some theatrical trailers. So if you like this movie or you like the debut or Cool Likes of Death, there is going to be a box set of all three coming together. And I think there's a new booklet in there. So you want to wait and grab all three together i'll be checking out the next one um next week to see how this trilogy kind of ends so yeah I, I enjoyed this one not as strong as the debut but still interesting stuff and uh they show kind of a like i said i like movies made in other countries and like uh, these dutch movies they have a great look to them so yeah okay this next one is from sub rosa films and this is one of their retro line and this is garden tool massacre that's right, Garden Tool Massacre. This is actually by the director of what? The House on Cuckoo Lane, which I did not know while I was watching. This is a 1997 or 98 Lost SOV movie. And, um, okay. So this is very amateur. This is a very amateur movie. It's obviously young men, maybe, you know, their teens, probably late teens, making a movie for fun. Um, that, that's ex exactly what it comes off as. So we have an escaped mental patient, um, who killed his girlfriend out of anger, uh, and went away and now he's broken out and he's going to use some garden tools to kill some people. The main characters in the film are a group of kind of young men that are all interested about partying and drinking. And there's like a, this movie's not very long, of course, like 70 minutes maybe. And there's like a 20 minute scene where absolutely nothing happens. Like there's just like a scene of a bunch of people like sitting in the house partying and you're like, when are these guys going to get killed? And this is like establishing the characters. Like the scenes are way too long and you can tell it's like a lot of padding. Like at one point there's like a, like you feel like it's six minutes like two shots of a guy shaving and then it, there is like a little payoff at the end of that but it, it like i was looking through the reviews on letterbox and one made me laugh it said shot in perpetual darkness and i was like it's about almost every independent SOV movie because there was non-independent SOV movies like like some of the ones like 555 or Blood Cult. They're like, we have lights. Like, we do have lights. We we do have a SOV camera, but we got lights and we're going to try to make this like a real movie. And it does make a difference. Like, look at like Redneck Zombies have real special effects. This is like a do-it-yourself violent shit style, but less effects than violent shit. Um so literally, I don't have that many positive things to say about the movie, except that it's a completed film and people that love SOV, SOV completists might be interested in it. Um, but the end, the killer actually does finally attack. Um, a lot of the characters, I barely remember them. I barely can hear that. It's, it's one that you ride the remote to where you're like up, 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 down, 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 up, 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 down. The music's loud. The dialogue's quiet, but also at the same time, you're like, I don't. 
I don't give a shit what they're saying. And I know that's kind of like a half-assed part of my point, but it's just like if I have to struggle too much to hear what they're saying, then uh, I'm sorry, I really can't. And it's just like the music would overpower everything, and you know, it's just typical teenage uh, uh, jabberjaw shit where you're like, I don't. It is what it is, you know. And there's like a, a big thing where people love a lot of SOV movies. They like they devour any SOV films what at all, especially if it's you know not a modern one. And I can understand there's a certain charm to the SOV movies. And I would recommend checking out Hassan Kuku Lane, where it's obviously a, a, a interesting story about a group of filmmakers that made a movie that absolutely love, um, you know, kind of the video nasties era of movies. And I thought that had an interesting story to it. This one there is even a shout out to Cannibal Ferox, where they all like, did you watch Cannibal? Ferox, which is very much um, like kind of almost like Amateur Mistake 101, where like they love horror films and they've watched a hundred horror films, but they never watched another independent horror film. So like right away they have to quote other horror films within their horror films just to do a weird shout out. And like it, it happens so much in like independent movies. Like I feel like a lot of people's first independent films they'll definitely quote another movie. Like if you look at um, what is it, My House of Rathiticus, they're like they play Texas Chainsaw Massacre too, and they're like we think the effects are great. It's just like such a it's such a um like independent like mistake that you always see and sometimes it works sometimes it's a little bit more clever than that but this one was obviously like shoehorned in to like show that hey we love horror movies and this is a horror movie made by people that love horror movies even if we probably don't know like because the mistakes made are obviously just amateur mistakes that everybody makes on an sov movie you know bad sound bad lighting long takes padding um this aimless direction at times. So just to be like, um, this is unwatchable. It is what it is. I mean, this is exactly what you expect to get from a independent SOV movie made in 1998 that was lost. It is what it is. And I remember somebody was making fun of his like, I don't consider a knife a garden tool, but Hey, there is some gore at the end. There is a decent uh, kill count, but hey, there is some downtime, some, some, a lot of downtime that I could do without. And then it will just cut in. You'll see the killer. And it's just like, this doesn't even look like the same movie for a second. But anyways, that's garden tool massacre. Not to like bag on the movie because it is exactly what you expect. And if somebody goes in like this, it's like, what did you expect? Expect Garden Tool Massacre SOV movie from 1998. Lost one. This is exactly what you're going to get, and it's, it doesn't lie. You get you get what you get. Okay, so doing the summer series, there's some movies that I get to revisit. And one of them I absolutely adored in 2016. So revisiting this wasn't going to be much of a problem, but it's The Greasy Strangler. Hey, and this kind of matches my shirt, which I kind of like that a little bit. Yeah, um, I, I don't usually wear bright colors. You guys know me. But anyways, the greasy freaking strangler. Oh boy, oh boy. This is the MVD Film Rise release. There was a import that I did watch. This is the first time watching this one. Um, there's a bunch of features on this one as well, which is pretty cool. Okay. The Greasy Strangler is a movie that if somebody told me it was their favorite film of all time, I'd be like, right on, man. If somebody told me it was the worst film they've ever seen in their life, I'd say, right on, man. It's a movie that is going to be made for certain people, okay? Um, comedy is such a subjective thing. Like, certain times people be like, well, I like the cinematography in this, and if it's literally just like a dark, nothing's there, you're like, this is objectively bad cinematography. I'm sorry, like, it's literally just a standstill camera in a dark room with no lights. Like, this is just blackness. This is not good. You could tell people, like, but, like, the stuff that some people find funny, it's really hard if you don't get it. You live different life experiences. Like, um, so it's really hard. This one, okay, I find it funny. It get and... I've always been from that class of I hate over-the-top purpose acting, but when I watch something like A Killing of a Sacred Deer, I don't see that. I see a weird acting style done on purpose to fit the tone of this world. I see that in Greasy Strangler, too. Except the tone of this world is a repulsive hellscape of disgust and grossness. So, um, it stars Michael St. John, uh, Saint John, Michael St. John's or something like that. He was in the video deck. In the opening of the video, Dead, he popped up in Fingers that came out uh, 2018, 2019. He's really good in that. Also has uh, another guy, Sky Elbar, um, who popped up in Candy Corn. And the lead actress in here, she looks vaguely familiar. And yeah, it's just a bizarre cast. Um, but I will say the three lead performances are, are really great. And really dedicated. So it follows the story of a father and son who live together. Um, the dad is really gross and he loves grease on everything. And, um, you probably think he's the greasy strangler. Um, so yeah, 
uh, basically the son and him do disco tours where they lie off their ass and show a bunch of places that aren't really in, in Hollywood or whatever it is and, and point to these shitty areas and scam people. Um, one day they meet a, a, a girl who's attracted to the son, uh, Brayden. So they start to date. The father kind of interferes and there's like a love triangle thing going on. Meanwhile, there is a greasy strangler played by Michael St. John's who is the father going around and killing people that piss him off throughout the day. And um, he's a cannibal he loves Greece, so he's always saying these really gross things. The movie has this weird sense of humor that is puke-inducing, um, and it has a repetitive touch where they'll do a lot of repetitive-style humor, which is a lot of people do find very funny, where it, at first it's not funny when you say it once. You say it five times, it's not funny, and then when you get past the ten minute, the ten times, it's hilarious, and then it gets funnier and funnier and funnier for some people. So they do a lot of that, and that, that's very much shown in the scene with the three kind of uh, tourists the foreign tourist, the Indian, the African, and the Swedish tourist character with the portal chips, which is very funny to me, which a lot of people won't get or find funny. They'll find it great grating on their nerves. And I get it, but I love it. So and there's also these really wild, over-the-top special effects. Um, the thing about the movie is someone might say that this, I hate this, but it's the movie that people quote the most from that year. Like if you look at anything else from 2016, like... Train to Busan is an amazing movie. The Wailing is an amazing movie. Tell me a quote from it. I know they're foreign films, but still, tell me a line from the movie. Eyes of My Mother, tell me a line. I mean, there's some in there, but still, it's hard. Greasy Strangler has dozens. This isn't right. I bet you think I'm the Greasy Strangler. I want this dog to lubricate the world. There's just so much weird stuff in the movie that you're going to love it or hate it, and I'm on the loving side, okay? It starts to get almost avant-garde at the end, like with the weird out-of-body like stuff. Uh, it's just a bizarre film. And I think they do actually say something to a point here that um, when the father and son talk to each other, she was gross. Yeah. And it's just like how disgusting they actually are to even have the nerve to say that too uh, after all the stuff you've seen them do. But at the same time, uh, I just feel like it's a unique movie. It's a movie where weird shit happens seemingly for no reason, but you're in in the whole movie. Um, there's this great part in the film um, where they argue back and forth, bullshit artists. And I've caught myself saying bullshit artists to people, caught myself saying, this isn't right. Um, just like, it, it's just a weird thing. You love it or hate it. And I get both. I, I, it's not a hill I would die in if somebody told me they hated it and they yelled at me for liking it. I would just start laughing hysterically. I just couldn't help it. I just, I would enjoy watching someone else's misery through the movie. I would get pleasure out of their misery for the greasy strangler. Um, as far as the special features are concerned, it was really kind of, um, uh, I was very happy to see the interviews with the cast and crew because Michael St. John, I, I just wanted to see that these people weren't, um, you know, because it's such a strange, like, acting style from all of them. Like, I just want to make sure that they're all, like, normal people. Like, you know, sometimes you watch these movies like Bag Boy, Lover Boy, or um, Cat Sick Blues, and, or Be My, Be My uh, Cat, a film for Anne. You're like, even though that's the director of the film, you're like, oh, man, these performances are so wild and over the top and strange. Like, I hope that these are, like normal people that are healthy and functioning. He just didn't go to the insane asylum and pull them out and be like, all right, we're going to make a movie. I'm going to exploit the shit out of you. No, all these people are normal people. It's just their performances are so wild that you start to think they're nuts. Um, so see Michael St. John's like get this starring role and talk about it. He said he's had, uh, he said, this is the most fun I've had during, than anything except maybe sex. And sometimes it's funner than sex. So like, he's a funny guy. He really enjoyed himself and he's, amazing in the movie and, and sky uh they have interviewed sky he goes over it and the interview with the actress in here i can't think of the character name but she is straight she's a straight shooter she's like well you know uh she starts to tell the absolute truth about the director and stuff like he's a commercial director he directs a lot of commercials and stuff and you know he's a nice guy but and i was just like that's refreshing to hear somebody not just like because you see a lot of these pad behind the scenes stuff and like it was absolutely tremendous to work with everybody everybody was a national treasure and nothing bad ever happened and you're like all right get the fuck out of here and then when you get somebody like her or like michael rooker they're like I remember Rooker on the Dark Half uh, uh, interview. He's like, don't like the guy. <laughs> Timothy uh, Hutton or something. I was like, I can appreciate him being honest like that. He's like, we're not friends. And I was just like, yes, thank you. Um, so, uh, and, and then we get the my favorite uh, interview 
um, was with the three tourists. And these are kind of like bit actors, like in commercials and stuff like that. And they've had probably just working kind of character actor careers their entire life. So there's 22 minutes with all three of them sitting down and them talking about the movie and everything like that. They're adding like a, a layer of, you know, um, it kind of like they're talking about, like it gives some credibility having Elijah Wood produce it. And I was just like, you know, this was really kind of refreshing to see, like, because you never see her interviews with kind of like actors that pop up in commercials here and there. And they're such bizarre characters within the movie that you're like, I don't know who these guys are, but they're really very highly intelligent people and they understand exactly what the type of crazy movie this is, more so than I do even. And, um, yeah, I just appreciated their thoughts about the movie, and I like that behind the scenes. Um, there's also one of an actor who's like four roles in here, and I noticed the first time I noticed him in multiple roles. I was like, oh shit, he's there, and he's there, and he's there, and then when I watched the interview, I was like, okay, it's that guy. That's very cool. So uh, yeah, uh, just kind of really interesting stuff, and um, the excitement for some that some of the people had for the movie is also nice to see, and it didn't seem like bullshit. So The Greasy Strangler, uh, you love it or hate it, I'm on the loving side. There's also a commentary on the disc, so check it out um this came out quite a while ago i just never got around to it finally checking it out again and i'm happy to do so okay another one for the summer series that i'm revisiting is, that i did enjoy when it came out is i am not a serial killer and i might have covered this one before i don't remember if i ever talked about it um so yeah i think this is based off a graphic novel uh correct me if i'm wrong it stars i can't think of the actor's name in here but the big name is christopher lloyd of course who i absolutely love christopher lloyd from dennis the menace to um uh, cuckoo's nest to frickin who framed roger rabbit He's, he's pretty much a classic actor, always loved him. Um, Back to the Future, of course. Um, do I even need to mention that one? Everybody knows that movie, that series. So I Am Not a Serial Killer is a super interesting movie because um, we've seen millions of movies where um, you follow a lead character and they're obviously emotionally, psychologically damaged and you're just waiting for them to snap. Serial killer films or something like even the weird movies like Be My Cat, a film for Ann, or Cat Sick Blues, or, or Bag Boy, Lover Boy, or even more on the lines of like Pigs or Trauma. You just know these people are ready to snap. Like it, it's kind of like a coming, or even like the coming of age kind of style too, where we have a lead character in this film as a young man who works with his mom at a mortuary embalming and helping with those kind of things. He is a sociopath. He's seeing a psychiatrist. He knows he's a sociopath. He's dealing with it every day and trying to overcome it. He doesn't have the same feelings. He doesn't feel the same way as other people. Um, and he's trying to overcome that, which is a very interesting aspect to put him as the protagonist of a movie because there was a serial killer going around this small town in Wisconsin um, killing people. And he starts to kind of snoop around and he discovers who the serial killer is. And um, he it's not your typical serial killer. There is something different about this person something um a little bit off and it's very strange so he starts to dig into it and try to discover what makes this person do this what makes this person stick around and kind of very interesting to learn that a person who supposedly has no empathy because they're a sociopath and then somebody uh who is killing others actually is doing it for a reason of you know empathy or or love which i i thought was interesting and it's an interesting way to tackle it this movie also has a great idea that uh i, I mean a great feel because it feels legitimately cold the movie takes place during the entire winter, kind of like the Christmas season. So there's like always people out at night looking for the killer. There's like a very small town feel that I think is very effective. So when somebody's killed, everybody feels it. Um, there's a great moment where police are involved and the person does the right thing, but it backfires in the worst kind of way. Um, Lloyd's very good in it. He quotes some poetry and uh, he's a very effective actor as always. But the the uh, game changer in here is the lead, the, the young kid. I think he's great. I think his demeanor's great. Uh, there's a moment when he talks to a bully at a dance, which I thought was probably one of the strongest acting moments in the movie. And he kind of reminds me of like a Culkin, like a lost Culkin brother or something like that. So I think it's a very good movie. I think it's well done. I think it's interesting. I think it's different. I think it's uh, uh, kind of a little, I know people like it, but it's a little hidden gem. It's a good film. It's a good film. And it's a take on the serial killer genre that is a little bit different. And I like that. And I appreciate that. And I love the look of the movie. It's got a great look. And that goes a long way. It's got a great feel to it. Uh, the music is good. Just an all-around great little film. I am not a serial killer. So, yeah. What better way to follow up I Am Not a Serial Killer? Um, wait, did I have three serial killer movies in a row? Greasy Strangler, uh, I'm Not a Serial Killer, and then we're going to have Eyes of My Mother. 
Um, Nicholas Pesh, uh, Pesh's debut, I believe, film debut, uh, 2016 movie. Um, very short film. Uh, I love this damn thing. Uh, if you guys, I, I've always liked this one. I don't know if I've ever talked about it on the show, or maybe it was before I was doing the weekly thing, but uh, Eyes of My Mother. Okay, so we so often see serial killer films that follow a male lead. Sometimes we do have like more of the female lead, like I mentioned Pigs or something like that, which is an underrated film. But um, this one is, is very different. Uh, it's told in three parts. I think it's mother, father, and daughter, or son, son, something like that. And we follow the lead character here, who is obviously a very socially awkward person. The opening of the film, it, it's a, a mother, um, a father. And they both seem a little old to be having a daughter this young, which I feel could possibly contribute to this person's kind of mental uh, problems, but there's other things as well, nature and nurture involved, of course. They live in this isolated farm, and she's learning, you know, kind of the, tr the trades that her mother, you know, I think was an um, animal uh, veterinarian or, or surgeon or something along those lines. They work on a farm, so she's teaching her, you know, to cut the eyes out of the cow and everything like that that plays into it. Um, one day this strange man approaches and something horribly tragic happens. It's a very disturbing scene. It's in stark black and white. It, it looks great. It's shot well. There's lots of moments where the film breathes and it's just creepy. So something really messed up happens. It's really tragic. Obviously a traumatic experience for her and her father, who is almost silent throughout the entire film. So this first part goes by and we see kind of like the reasons, maybe the creation of why she ends up being this way. And I mentioned it was a serial killer film, and it most definitely is. Um, the portrayal of this character, the second part of the film, let's go, is, is kind of more like a father. It feels like that Morris County kind of thing, the last story in that, without spoiling too much, uh, a little bit of that going on. And the portrayal of this killer, it's very interesting because um, a lot of the killers in real life, the female serial killers or, or spree killers or mass murders or whatever, I'm not sure if there's ever been typically a female spree killer unless you consider like duos like Bonnie and Clyde and Alton Coleman and the woman he was with, stuff like that. But you get this real kind of weird aspect that you get the loneliness of the killer in here, which makes her sympathetic in a weird, twisted way. She's like a mixture of Ed Gein, Dennis Nielsen, and Jeffrey Dahmer. She's that kind of type where she seems like a product and... Um, a process killer but she also is doing it out of this weird loneliness and longing and her family dynamic was so messed up and cut short and the isolation and everything just plays into this uh, the second part has like this wonderful moment where she's kind of interested she she actually goes to town and we realize this movie isn't uh, as big a period piece as we once thought it was which is kind of a, a great reveal and I Maybe should have kept that a little down on the wraps. I'm sorry, but this movie is five years old at this point. So that whole moment is a masterclass in awkwardness um, and terrifyingness. And it doesn't show you everything that happens, but you don't need to because the horror lies within the conversation and the absolute trappedness that this character feels. And the final part, it's kind of like completing the entire story. Um, it's just a lot of twisted stuff within the movie and a lot of horrible stuff happening. Um, the, the third act, I, I thought... Originally, when I saw it, was the weakest, but I don't think so. I think all three acts are very strong now, and I love that it's short. I love that it's shot beautifully. I love that uh, there's not that much dialogue in it. It really works well, and there's the character in the beginning that did the whole awful thing. Um, she kind of repays him in a great way. You're right. It is amazing. <laughs> I just was like, yes, that kind of got you a little bit into her psyche there, that she is a process as well as a product, but her product, maybe she's not exactly a product. Because her product is not necessarily the body, it's actually just having them around before they die, which is very strange at the same time. Um, just This movie also reminded me that there's some fates worse than death. There's absolutely some fates worse than death. Um, just a great film. I love it. it. I'm a big fan of it. Um, I like my disturbing stuff when it's done well. And the funny thing is, he had a follow-up to this in Piercing. And I just didn't feel like Piercing worked as well. It was interesting, uh, but I didn't love it. I, I thought it was all right. This one I, I adore. And I heard his grudge uh, kind of sequel or whatever isn't very strong either. So um, I'm willing to give, you know, Piercing another shot. But I'm going to definitely check out if he come, makes out another film that's original, you know, of his own. Um, because I love this one. And I think it's a work of art. And I know some people will be like, well, there's nothing there. I was like, there's a lot there to me. Like just exploring this kind of psycho psychological nature of this character and this kind of sadness within them. Some people might not want to be in a room with this person for, you know, 70 minutes or anything like that. But um, 
I don't want to say I enjoyed my time, but it, um, I, I enjoy the film. So I guess I did enjoy my time. I guess this stuff interests me. Maybe it's a, um, a quality I just don't have kids of my own. So seeing some of this stuff doesn't affect me as much, but I do feel sick and upset at certain points in the film. But I guess um, it doesn't always turn me away from a movie. I guess a movie with power a lot of times works for me. And this one, I feel like it's there. I, I like it quite a bit. So Eyes of My Mother, great performance too from the lead and, and the character Charlie. And everybody involved, I thought was pretty solid in the film. So yeah, good stuff. Oh boy, this is a big one from 2016, and this is The Wailing, a South Korean film, which everybody for a long time was like, you gotta see The Wailing, you gotta see The Wailing. And I was like, I know, but it's like two and a half hours long. And So finally, here I am to talk about The Wailing. Um, you know what? South Korea doesn't disappoint. They have never disappointed me, but we usually get the good stuff, right? They're going to import the good stuff. They're not going to import, you know, a steaming pile of shit and then hype it up. They're only going to give us the best. So, so far, South Korea's got a great track record with me, and it doesn't end with The Wailing. It's still, a, it's, a, it's a fantastic movie, a long, epic film. Uh, it takes place in this small village, which I love. Um... And it follows these uh, this cop who's kind of a bumbling idiot. So we kind of get this element of comedy at certain points in here, which is a very hard kind of thing to juggle. You know, comedy with the serious nature of this movie is it's, it's not always the easiest thing to do. It's not always easy to handle tone like that. And for some reason, it works in the South Korean films. It works better in Asian films. And I maybe it took me a while to kind of adjust to that over time, maybe a decade or so. But at this point, I've kind of fallen in love with that tone. But it's a hard tone to do. And I probably would ridicule some movies and praise others. I don't know how to, it's a fine line, right? So the Wailing's comedy, I think, works really well. So essentially what happens is this um, this detective or the sergeant, I think he's a sergeant, he's not necessarily a detective, a sergeant, he gets a call that um, something really messed up has happened. His family forces him to eat before he goes. So there's a little comedy in that. And this is a kind of rainy day in this small village. He drives out there and he realizes that there's been a horrible murder, that somebody in their family went kind of snapped and killed somebody else in their family. But they did it under strange circumstances. They drove somewhere where they weren't supposed to. It's just really weird. It doesn't make any sense in a, in a logical sense for this person to do this or how they did it. And they're covered in these boils. Their eyes are, have gone white and they seem sick. And it's very strange. It's very unpleasant. So um, they start to investigate that stuff. And another thing happens like that, where the, there's a house set on fire and awful things. And meanwhile, the detective's starting to have nightmares. And there's this weird kind of, you know, behind the scenes kind of gossip happening around the town that it's all the, that this of this Japanese man who's moved into this town. And everybody's blaming him. They're saying he's a demon, a wolf. He eats raw deer, all these kind of stories like that. Um, they start to kind of investigate, talk to the other people that have seen him, and it leads to all these kind of strange things, and it starts this feud between the sergeant and this Japanese man who lives in isolation. Um, we call in a shaman who um, basically, when they start to believe that people of their own family are getting sick and they're trying to stop this. So it gets really kind of crazy and complicated and um, really epic um, to, to make any, it's, and uh, the town feels legit. People are ending up dead. People are getting sick. People are going crazy and people are getting kind of possessed if you will look at it in that way. And this movie doesn't start off as a possession movie. It starts off as a weird kind of murder movie. And you're like, well, is there a, a infectious disease causing these people to snap? And it kind of goes more into like a super, even more supernatural aspect than that. It turns into a revenge film. There's just these lots of great moments that happen. Um, and the very end of the film, like they incorporate um, some ghost stuff, which is kind of a callback to like a lot of uh, classic Japanese cinema. Like um, what is the um, one quite on the story with that? This, 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 the style of the Japanese ghost that they have in the film. Reminds me of those old school kind of Japanese ghost films with the, you know, the, the gown and the pale skin. And I really like that. Not the Japanese modern with the hair in the face and stuff. So I was like, yeah, this definitely has its roots in that as well as kind of like the Korean revenge films as well. So it's like a mixture of classic Japanese ghost stories, maybe even Korean. I'm not familiar with their kind of ghost stories and the kind of modern or more modern revenge films from Korea too. So it's got a lot of stuff going for it. The acting's top notch. You actually care for a lot of the characters and it is dark. Boy, it is dark. It gets very dark. And it's strange because I said that tone with the comedy maybe wouldn't work, but in this one, it, it ends up working really well. And yet at the end of the film, I'm sitting here like, is it? Is it? No. Yes. No. Yes. No. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But boom. It just worked really well. Um, great film, man. Great, great, great stuff. Uh, really highly recommended. Um, 
one of the better movies I've seen from 2016. The problem is it's two and a half hours long. So it's, it's, it's hard for you to sit down and watch it. Like in America, everything's two and a half hours long now. So you're like, eh, nah, nah. it's really hard to press the button. But a lot of foreign films for me, like if they're two and a half hours long, like you, like I said, most of the South Korean stuff that we get here is long, but it's mostly always good. So I'm more willing to watch it. I just need to find the time. But like in America, everything's now two and a half hours long. So like Army of the Dead is a zombie film. It's like two and a half hours long. I'm just like, I want to watch that. But do I want to watch a two and a half hour like action zombie film thing? Like, I don't know. Like, but if you tell me The Wailing and it's just like this, this like drama horror insane movie and it's great. I'm, I'm more willing to watch something like that. But when you see that runtime, it, it can be a little intimidating. But uh, don't let that intimidate you. Check out The Wailing. I know a lot of people really enjoyed it. I did myself. Um, so we got two heavy hitters from 2016 as far as South Korean uh, long-ass movies are concerned in that and Train to Busan. Train to Busan is a little under two hours, though, so uh, definitely more approachable. Uh, this one is a little bit of a head uh, kind of screw at the same time, The Wailing. So um, really enjoyable, though. I, I enjoyed it. And you guys know that I'm not the biggest on possession films, so for me to give kind of like a, a glowing review of it, it's definitely something special. Okay, this next one here, I, I guess I had it on uh, Amazon Prime. I think I bought it, or one of my friends bought it on digital back when on the Voodoo. You could kind of combine your accounts. And this is Annabelle Creation. So, so I, um, you guys know me. This is a 2017 summer series. Um, I don't care much for The Conjuring. I warmed up a bit to The Conjuring too. So when we saw Annabelle Creation, I was like, I didn't watch any of those Annabelle movies. This is supposed to be like the first one, man. I don't want to watch this. I am not watching any more ghost stories. I don't like American ghost stories. So I'm sitting there, you know, kind of my arms crossed. Like this is going to be generic by the book kind of stuff here. Um, we start and uh, right off the bat, uh, we have kind of the tragedy where somebody is killed. And I'm like, okay, this this has a little bit more guts. This has got a little bit more haunting than I expected. All right, I'm in. Although that was typical, I'm in. So uh, essentially what happens is there's this loving couple. The father is a toy maker. He makes dolls. The Annabelle dolls, of course. Um, Anthony LaPelge, or however you say his name, he's in a slew of movies, of course, Innocent Blood. He's just like, you know, he's one of these like New York kind of actors, I believe he's from New York, where it's like, we need an um, Italian mobster guy. And like, we got like him and like six other guys. They're all going to be in the movie. He's always in the movie. He's a good actor. He's good in this. So he's, he's a doll maker. Him and his wife have a young daughter. They adore. One day, there's a tragic thing that happens. We fast forward years down the line. They have this big abandoned farmhouse. They want to help out. So uh, there's an uh, orphanage uh, that's traveling. They need a place to stay. I think there's six uh, or six six young girls, a nun. So um, the mother uh, had some trouble. So she's kind of isolated. Her face is ban like kind of fanned into the opera up. She doesn't want to show because she had some problems. So basically. They're going to stay at this orphanage and everything like that. One of the girls is, is uh, disabled. She's got had polio, so she's got the crutches and everything like that. And there's this really creepy stair elevator. Think Gremlins, but more classic uh, old school kind of house thing, um, you know, where the chair goes up. Um, so they're all going to stay there. And pretty, pretty quickly, there's this isolated room where their young daughter used to live. The crippled girl goes in there, or the disabled girl, and she uh, uncovers Annabelle. The creepy doll. And of course, the doll starts to kind of overtake the house. The doll's been reawoken, and strange, creepy things start to happen. Um, very typical setup in a lot of ways, but uh, putting children at the main focus to be scared, and, and it does the possession kind of deal at the same time. But it's genuinely scary and effective. Like, I'm sitting there with my arms crossed. I turn off the lights. I'm sitting there, and there's two scenes where I jumped. And I, I'm not be like, I don't get scared. I mean, I jump sometimes, but... They were really well-crafted scares where I was like, oh, shit, I jumped. I literally jumped. And one was a scene where I would never expect to do it. The sound uh, the sound design was so effective at it that I literally jumped when uh, it's such a it's, it's kind of cheesy to admit that I did it. But in the way where they say, what do you want? Your soul. And I just that is such a generic thing. But it got me. It literally got me to where I jumped. Um, so, yeah, there's some genuine scares and people die which doesn't typically happen in the Conjuring movies. People don't really die. This one, there's some death. There's a couple deaths in here, one which is kind of gory. So at the end of the day, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the movie, and uh, I would give it a recommend. I also like that it takes place in an isolated kind of desert community style. Typically, you don't see that in too many ghost stories. You see maybe monster movie will have that, or The Cellar is kind of isolated in that aspect as like a monster, but it's supernatural. Um, but you don't see too many ghost stories in the desert, unless you count Ghost Town, but that's a little bit different too. So you don't see the typical haunting stuff in this typical era, in this area typically. So typical, 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 I keep saying it. Anyways, enjoyed it more than I thought I would. 
genuinely scary stuff for kind of your run-of-the-mill ghost story. A little bit better than that. I was I was happy with it. I was surprised. Okay, now we have a couple from 1970. Uh, and bear with me. Um, I watched these early in the week, but I didn't really like them. So I, I want to say this one is called The Ansons, A-N-C-I-N-E-S, Woods, The Ansons Woods. And this is a movie I have never heard one person bring up. I'm sure a lot of like the big, you know, people that know a lot about horror films know it. This is based on a true story <laughs> where we had this guy who was uh, believed, he believed he was a werewolf. And of course, you know what werewolves do. So the opening of this film falls, uh, it opens up beautifully. We have these three young boys kind of spying on uh, these guys mating, uh, kind of breeding a horse or studying out a horse or something like that. And they're watching and the other two boys push this young boy off and he rolls down and he's like whipped or something. And obviously we zoom in on his eyes and we see like this change in him, of course, like right that moment, it's like, this kid's not right. This is definitely a contributing factor to what's not right. And then we fast forward, we have like a dissolve or a changeover where now he's older and he's in these woods and he's laying there and you're like, okay, this starts off really effective. <laughs> so the main character here, is a, a man who suffers from epileptic fits, but he believes he's a werewolf. Um, we have these um, great moments here. So he his job is essentially to take people from one area. He's kind of like a, 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 a peddler where he'll pick up stuff, religious you know, uh, stuff from certain places, towns, and go to other towns and sell them and deliver things and deliver messages for kind of some wages and everything like that. He has a good reputation for being a decent person, um, but... He's not, obviously. So he has he suffers from this disease, but he considers himself a werewolf. So there's these murders happening. It's, it's fairly obvious he's a murderer. It's not like a secretive thing. But the opening of the film is done so brilliantly how deceitful he can be, where he actually is bringing these letters to this woman, and he plays like he can't read or write um, at all. But he's actually writing the letters and everything like that to like have these people invited so he can like kill them and rob them. But there's some really dark stuff in here and like some points where it was kind of darkly comedic where he was like trying to get out of like taking two people at the same time because he knew it was bigger risk. And um, it's just just really great moments too as well. Like the thick um, kind of gothic atmosphere, like the woods and everything. It just works really well. I, I really like this movie. I was really surprised. I never heard anyone talk about it. The acting was great. The story was interesting as hell, especially being based on a true story. It was just such an interesting concept and, and it's I'm, I'm, I love the true crime stuff but it's also this weird superstitious quality that I absolutely adore too in it where we have a lot of these townspeople that believe there is a true werewolf out there and then we have John Steiner in, in here which are Steiner is it Steiner or Steiner it's Steiner I think it's John Steiner who's in a slew of movies you guys will know him from everything from Ten and Bray to um, Caligula and he plays this reverend in here but he has a little bit more on the uh, doesn't really buy the superstitious stuff and there's this great moment where him and the uh, lead character, uh, he's kind of talking and he's saying these people believe in this superstitious stuff while they're walking and the lead character doesn't answer because he, I think, although is deceitful with his crime, he does have this weird psychosis where he believes he's a werewolf at the same time. So um, anyways, just, just a really bleak film too and dark, but like I said, it has its kind of comedic moments. It's short too, it's not overly long. Um, just really well acted, interesting film that um, it's a Spanish film and was based on a true story based off a book, which I understand was actually, this was kind of edited a little bit. I mean, the script to make religion look less negative because you know, the time with the Franco stuff. Anyways, excellent movie, hidden fucking gem through and through. Would not be surprised if this made my top 10 of 1970. Um, definitely going to rewatch it before we do that top 10 list, but man, uh, check this one out. It's so it's such a good movie, and I've never heard one person bring it up, and, I, and that doesn't make it better, but it makes it kind of baffling to me that I hear a million of the times these movies are brought up all the time. And here, let me say this right here. I know a lot of people bring this up, but we have a problem with, uh, and it's like, oh, I don't want to get on a high horse, but we have a problem with people just, if it's on Shutter, if it's on Netflix, they watch it. If it's on, you know, getting brand new release, they watch it. But they're not really exploring themselves. Some people do. Some people, but they're not exploring to dig in deep stuff. That's why I love doing these retro years for 22 shots. That's my favorite point of the year. And no matter what happens, I will always be doing retro years from now. And if 22 shots stops doing them, I'm still going to be doing the retro years myself. Because this is the most fun I have in discovering movies I haven't watched. Sometimes there's classics I just never got to. Other times there's movies that um, no one bothered to watch. I know millions of people probably watched this when it came out and I know it. And they're like, you're dumb, Dave. I can't believe you didn't see it. But 
I just like exploring these movies and finding them out. And the more that people explore these movies, the more people want to see them on DVD and Blu-ray and the better chance it will happen. So I know that if it's on Shutter, I've had people say this movie didn't come out this year because they didn't know that it got a Blu-ray release and it was widely available on Amazon and any store you can buy a movie. They're like, oh, that didn't come out because I couldn't find it on streaming. That doesn't count. It's just absurd to think. Like people aren't even buying a hard format disc or even looking at anything unless they can just watch it streaming. Well, is it streaming anywhere? I guess I'll never watch it. It's like, uh, maybe do some little bit of more research. And I'm not saying I'm not like download everything or steal everything. I mean, but if a movie's impossible to find, you search everywhere to buy it and you can't buy it. You got to find it somehow. You got to keep these movies alive. And that's the one thing that drives me nuts about film culture is they only talk about the movies that are presented right to their face to them. Like, you got a deep dive, man. Sometimes you got to be the guy to take a couple shit bombs to find something that's cool. And this is one. This is the Anson Woods. I think it's also the Wolf in the Woods. It's got a bunch of different alternative names, but just great stuff. Crazy uh, serial killer gothic film based on a true story that was written based off a book. So I really enjoyed this one. Great stuff. Okay, the next one from 1970, I would say, is another hidden gem. And this is The Strangler. But it's the French pronunciation of The Strangler not going to do that to me. I'm not going to do that to you. I can barely say my own name. All right. Why am I going to be pronouncing things in French? Um, yeah. So this is the strangler and this is more of a thriller, uh, more of a Hitchcockian kind of thing than a straight up horror film. But in the seventies, I feel like more things were considered horror that we would call more of an exploitation or thriller movie nowadays, just because the pickings are slim. Like in the fifties, sci-fi was more so considered the horror films of the time, right? The genre films like Them or Godzilla. It's like, those are horror movies. I still think the big monster movies can be considered horror films as well. But what we have here is The Strangler. And um, this really kind of blew my mind when I realized who the lead was. Like, um, he is the lead in Cinema Paradiso. And uh, I, I really hadn't seen him in anything else but that and, and a couple other things. But that's when I registered him. I said, that guy looks familiar. So then I was listening to Pure Cinema podcast and somebody mentioned cinema paradiso and they're like it's strange that the lead actor is i think it was elric is you know uh, a very famous french actor and i was like hmm, i just watched the strangler and i was like oh shit is that the guy because he looks so familiar so i looked it up and i was like oh my god the guy who stars in this was the star in cinema paradiso very cool very cool um so this is a bizarre film this is a bizarre thriller here. We have these kind of main characters in it. We have the Strangler himself, which is this very strange boy who I believe had just um, witnessed some strange things at a young age. It's just, I don't know how to explain his motivations, but he's a very bizarre killer. Um, then we have this young woman. It, it's a, such a movie about loneliness and, and, and a strangler. We have this young woman who is kind of almost obsessed with finding out who the killer is, like this attraction and possibly being strangled by the killer. And we have a detective who's on the case who's undercover kind of masquerading on this radio show to kind of provoke or bring the killer out to kind of see who he is and kind of find out, be the everyday man so people can approach him not knowing he's a cop. And then the fourth kind of character we have in this movie is a thief who is following the strangler around when he catches on and stealing from the victims. The victims are all middle-aged women um, that are ungodly lonely that this killer sees don't want to live that are possibly going to commit suicide so he just kind of does it for them. So, um, the kills aren't overly gratuitous or, or, or anything like that. They're all done. He knits this kind of, this scarf and strangles them with that. It's kind of like the idea where I've been strangled for three and a half seconds on screen and now I'm dead. So it's nothing like this, you know, long 30 fucking minute strangulation or like the golden glove or even as explicit as maniac or something like that. They're literally very quick deaths. They are still bothersome, obviously, but so the killer starts to communicate with this, uh, this, this radio personality at the same time as this young woman is communicating with the radio personality because she wants to figure out who the killer is. She starts to get involved with the radio personality who's a cop at the same time. And all these kind of four people start to intermingle and everything like that. And of course it's going to end tragically or, and, and, and whatnot. And it's just kind of a weird kind of exploration around this and, and the killer strikes. And there's some really good camera angles of following like the point of view of the car. And, um, this is just a, a weird movie that is a, a kind of on typical serial killer film that I enjoyed and I thought was well made and well acted and interesting as hell and I think could I'm sure people have seen this one because the director did a slew of movies that are, are more popular than this and the lead actor is a very popular actor but again being an American film fan it's not something I've ever heard brought up um, you know or talked about or explored 
Um, I'd love to see this get an American release. Um, this get, this would probably get a bigger release, you know, uh, maybe a bigger company. I don't know. This and the Anson Woods are, this is my third 1970s movie. And I'm like, oh shit, I've already watched one that's considered a very um, impactful classic in Equinox and two that are hidden gems right off the cuff. Like I, I, I mean, I am kind of selective with what I watch because I, I kind of know what I'm into and, and I deep dive and go through all the thrillers and horror movies. I'm like this, I think this will count. This will count. But this was a really good movie. This was really interesting, really different. Um, and, uh, just sad too. Like the character motivations are complex and, um, they don't seem like bullshit typically. Although the detective does some things that you're like, that's kind of bullshit. That's kind of dumb. But Hey, I enjoyed this one. And I think it is kind of the Hitchcockian style and, and, and stuff like that. But anyways, check it out. The Strangler, uh, good film, uh, interesting. And, like I just said, it has some unique camera stuff going on too, especially for 1970. Okay, the next one is the Patreon pick. And I believe it was Travis Linscombe who gave me this one. And he wanted me to cover Horror Rises from the Tomb from the Paul Nashie collection. Um, so I was very excited to check this one out. So Horror Rises from the Tomb. Is this a 1973, if I'm not mistaken? Um, 1973 is a very strong year in horror films. I think it is 1973. Um, so, okay, this opens up and I was like, wait a minute. This is just Paul Nashie's Black Sunday. Uh, by Mario Bava. So we have this warlock and his wife put to death by their own family. And I was like, this is very, um, we have a head hacked off, which is really cool. And it kind of fast forwards to modern time. Paul Nashi is a different character now, and he's going to go, I, I don't exactly remember all the details why they're going to go to this cabin, but right in the beginning, they're like on their way to the cabin and they're robbed by these, these, these asshole guys, which reminded me of, I think it happens in the opening of Panic Beats too, where like there's characters that rob them on a countryside road. It definitely happens in another Nashi movie that I watched in the last year or so, where it's almost the same fucking scene. So I was like, what? I don't know about this one, guys. I don't know about this. But then right after that, these kind of guys come and rescue them and they execute the guys right off the bat and i was like oh shit we got a weird little crazy town with its own set of rules they end up going to this cabin and this is kind of where um you know his ancestor had lived and all that stuff and of course you know exactly what's going to happen horror rises from the tomb so we have nashi's ancestor and this young woman kind of this this kind of like a witch and warlock rising and causing all sorts of shit there's people being picked off there's people being possessed and manipulated and turned into his kind of slaves and we hit like this midway mark where all these people that were killed rise from like the water and they like show up and they they attack the house and i was like oh boy man this reminds me of um the hanging woman um which is another spanish horror film which recently got released on blu-ray and let sleeping corpses lie so i was like we're in good hands here this is some really great gothic cool stuff uh love that stuff with the zombies attacking and everything like that and and somebody gets wasted at one point in the movie and i was like oh i did not see that coming i did not see that point coming right there where that character bit it but so it gets really bonkers at the end and i absolutely loved it it's gory there's guts falling out this is a really awesome movie too so nasty killing it with two movies this week both awesome um, so anyways, the end, there's a really effective special effect, um, here where a head rolls down the stairs, which I absolutely loved, um, which I believe that was possibly, uh, belonged to Nashi's family, that, uh, cabin or whatever, that, uh, whatever it was, that villa, because I think they mentioned that this is exactly where they sold it eventually, uh, for Howl of the Devil, and this was kind of the last time or whatever, but that head rolling down the stairs was beautiful, like, this is basically a kind of a remake of Black Sunday, but, not as strong as Black Sunday. It's going to be really hard to do. But, um, or Mask of Satan, however you want to say it. Um, but, uh, is it Mask of Satan or Mask of Satan? Mask of Satan, yeah. So, um, but it's really kind of an effective update of it, really. And um, there's gore and there's funness and there's insanity and lots of people get killed and it's dark. And I just love the hell out of it, especially when the zombies rose from their watery grave. I was like, or they, they went to find them, to kill them. So they didn't rise the night again and they're in like the water and shit. Just um, great movie, really entertaining, really wild, really uh, insane. It's got some dark shit to it. Um, just effective as hell. Nashy playing three roles in this one again maybe more <laughs> i feel like he's everybody i wouldn't be surprised if one day they like pulled up a sword and nashi was just a sword the movie too like Ugh! like <laughs> he's in he does so much shit in all these movies so like really he's like the spanish man of a thousand faces you know anyways um this movie was really entertaining loved it uh how horror rises from the tomb like maybe i'll just go through the whole set if i get time and pop out of the second set and then 
try to tackle all the werewolf movies too. I know that some of them had German Blu-rays that didn't get released here and they're out of print. So I do probably have um, bootlegs of those on Blu-ray coming. Um, so yeah, um, anyways, like I, if I can't buy the actual disc, um, if it's out of print, I will buy bootlegs. I don't give a shit until they're released and then I'll buy the real release. But uh, yeah, anyways, Nashy, the man, two for two this week. What? What is this? Zombie Bloodbath 2, Rage of the Undead. Oh. What? You ain't seen Zombie Bloodbath 2, Rage of the Undead? Nah, I guess I must have missed that one. You ain't seen nothing. You ain't seen nothing. I've seen way more than you. Mm -hmm. You haven't seen Taxi Driver, Goodfellas, Casino, Cannibal Holocaust, The Beginning, The Great Escape, Kelly's Heroes. Once upon a time in the fucking West! You haven't seen War and Peace, Pink Flamingos, Casablanca, Gone with the Wind, Citizen Game, The Alvin and the Chipmunks Christmas Special. You haven't seen, hmm, what else haven't you seen? The Magnificent Seven? The Magnificent Seven Ride Again? The Magnificent Seven Are Back? Is that a movie? And last of all, you ain't seen Zombie Bloodbath 2, Rage of the Undead. And you haven't seen War and Peace. I ain't watching War and Peace. The hell you are. Fuck War and Peace. All right, we're here for You Ain't Seen. This is your pick. And uh, what film did you pick for me to watch for the first time? Robocop 8. There, but we is, didn't watch that. There one. is not a Robocop. Movie. <laughs> there's a ro there's three Robocop movies, and then there's like two TV, maybe three. I don't know how many TV movies they made. I don't care. Uh -huh. After Robocop, uh, Robocop three, I'm pretty sure me and ninety percent of the people were done with Robocop movies. Um, you pick Secret of Nim mm -hmm. from 1982, directed by Don Bluth, who is one of the premier animated animated directors of all time. He also did what American what Tale. Mean, all time, no. Just some bloke. Shut up. <laughs> Don Bluth is very <laughs> world renowned. And he also did, um, did he direct the Brave Little Toaster? Or did he just. Uh, produce... He had nothing to do with uh, Blue Little Toaster. He did, so he did American Tale. Yeah, which is the one um, I grew up with. As a yeah. Kid. All Dogs Go to Heaven. Okay. Uh, Anastasia. Okay. Titan AE, I think he had some hand in. Um, he was, uh, I think, Penguin in the Pebble, a Troll in Central Park. Troll in Central Park for sure. Um, you know, obviously, Secret of Nim was like his first major one. Um, so he was a Disney animator, and I think he did stuff. Like, I think he started on Black Cauldron, like started. He didn't start there. I think it was a Sword of the Stone first. But he was working on Black Cauldron, and Disney tried to take it over, screwed it up, and he pretty no. much, no? No. Um, he was a Disney employee. He was okay. a Disney animator. And he started, you know, when he was working on Black Cauldron, that's kind of like... Black Cauldron is like the movie that broke Disney. It's like, hey, we're, we're never going to financially recover from this. Um, and so Don Bluth left. He started his own studio. And when and so he makes Secret of Nim. That's his first. Well, why did Black Cauldron get all monkeyed with? They get all messed up. Well, I'm actually going to pick Black Cauldron for you later so we can okay, talk okay, about right, that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that, say, that'll be in a future episode when we okay. get to talk about Black Cauldron. A fantastic, horrible, butchered movie. Um, so yeah, so Secret Name is his first major motion picture by his studio, um, and it's fantastic. It's based off a book. I grew up with it. Um, characters are great in it. It's essentially about a mouse who has to move her home before the farmer plows his field, and to do this, she needs the help of some magical rats, but not magical. But they're they smart. have, they somewhat magical. They are basically teenage mutant ninja turtle rats. Yes, they, yes. Got the, they got the ooze on them. They know the secret of the ooze. Uh, right. I don't even know. That's pretty much the plot here. But mm -hmm. we have uh, voice talents of. Geez, who are the voice talents in here? The most famous is of course um, Carradine. Oh yeah, John Carradine's in here. Yeah. We have somebody else, Dom DeLuise. Dom DeLuise. And I laughed hysterically at the end when I realized that the drunk kind of goon that. Re, doesn't really want to help the main baddie was he played wasn't by, a <laughs> drunk <laughs> it was aldo ray <laughs> aldo ray has a fantastic voice by yeah the way. well i love aldo ray so when i saw i just couldn't 
I just automatically assume the character is a drunk because he was <laughs> He has like a short, stout stature. But yeah. th- there is no alcohol in this movie whatsoever. There's barely any eating or drinking. There is a, a, a drink of some potion. Okay. Some medicine. So, so it, it feels pretty much... Well, they have to move quick and the, the, the main character, she can't move because her son has the ammonia. Yeah, pneumonia. Pneumonia, yeah. Yeah. Uh, not the chemical. Oh no, he would be dead. <laughs> if he drank that. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, I thought it was really cool how uh, it had like a dark touch to it and like a magic touch. Mm-hmm. And it's like these... Um, I don't know how to explain it. I want to say it's like a Ray Bradbury touch too. Like that kind of darkness, like the Halloween tree or something. That there is danger within the kids' film. And all those animated kids' films had, in early Disney too, mm-hmm. had that sense of danger, which I actually really love. Um, but also a sense of like whimsy. Like a sense of whimsy and danger and true adventure because with true adventure, there has to be danger. Right. Um, I think Don's Blues works tend to side on, with maybe the exception of Penguin and the Pebble and Troll in Central Park, tend to side on a more darker tone, more darker style animation, darker environments. Um, more he, realistic animation. Yeah, maybe. Not softer edges on some of the characters. Like, the humans always look very human. He, he, he has a very scratchy style. Yeah. Um, I, I've always adored his style. Um, and and I, I think my favorite thing that when it comes to Don Blue's works is, like, I love how his characters interact with the environment. Um, and, and, like, I don't feel like you see this a lot in Disney. So, like, Disney has a few um, movies with, that involve, like, small places like you have the rescuers you have the great mouse detective you know so mice are small so something like exploring like a lawnmower will be a really cool set piece and don bluth like does these fantastic yeah. scenes he's like how they interact with the environment props things and like you just don't see that stuff in disney movies like you watch the great mouse detective a lot of it takes place in a clock and it's like no like little uh winding things but they in this one they definitely when they tear apart the tractor to say um it's like they go through the gas line they rip up the fuel line and all that Mm -hmm. kind of stuff it's really fun and who was the uh it was very funny the character auntie shrew she's a shrew there's lots of fun characters in here too um the great owl the great owl is carradine um, and who was the uh, the main rat, uh, the bad rat? He was also pretty the good. The bad rat, or yeah. the so the bad rat is, um, I think it's Jenner. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he so basically the the main conflict is is like the rats are intelligent and they're they're stealing electricity from the farm. They they were lab experiments. Um, they escaped the lab once they be, once they got like human intelligence, um, but. The company that they escaped from, the lab, they're, like, tracking them down. And so it's like, hey, they're in the rose bush, and the rats are like, we can either leave and go off, you know, and, like, start our civilization over, or we can stay here but risk getting caught. So half the, the rats... Conflict. Yeah, so half the rats want to stay, the other half want to leave. The, the leader rat, Nicodemus, is like a old wizard rat or something. He's got a little, a little crystal, and he can see people in his magic mirror, and... Uh, he writes a book. Yeah, and that's um, all because they got the basically the intelligence and the lab experiments. The the one knock on this movie is by the time like it starts to end, you think mm-hmm. there's going to be like twenty more minutes. You think that there's going to be another solid big adventure. Like you think there'll be like a bigger bad or like they'll settle with the cat or something. But it really doesn't. It's not traditional in that sense if you compare it to other animated movies from the time. Oh yeah, I mean th- th- this movie, it, you know, there, there's no plot twist. There's no. I mean, there's some big reveals, like, like when you find out, like, what Nim is. And, and even yeah. that isn't, like, a big reveal. It's, like, told in a backstory. Well, um, Dom DeWeese is a great character, and he's pretty much the comic, mostly the yes. comic relief. Because he is always, like, clumsy, super clumsy, and always worried about not finding a mate. And at the very end, of course, you know, it all comes to fruition for him. But he's definitely the comedic kind of character. Oh, he's them. definitely the comedic and character. Oh, um, way over the top, too. Yeah, and they, they um... Typically, when stuff starts to get super serious in the movie, they'll cut to the crow scenes to yeah, kind of lighten it up. Yeah, which I mean, you know, typical. Like like Don Bluth, I think, or not? Yeah, Don Bluth. He does use like stock characters, so you'll see the same character types in, in this. Anastasia, all dogs go to heaven. I mean, uh, Dom De Luis is, I think, a voice in three that I know of. He's uh, 
the crow in this. He's itchy. Yeah, yeah, in definitely. Our dogs, dogs go to, to heaven. heaven. I, I, I think I, I've seen that one as a kid. Yeah, sure. and he, he's the, the the fat cat in the good cat in uh, American Tale. Oh, I haven't seen American Tale since yeah. I was five. It's weird that I've seen American Tale and All Dogs Go to Heaven, but this is the one that I didn't recall at all if I ever seen. This was the I think the. I might have seen the All Dogs Go to Heaven first, but um, th- this one was before, and it's just, it, it's always been a personal favorite of mine. I might have seen it before All Dogs Go to Heaven. I couldn't and tell. And you're it. named after the crow, right? I am named after the crow, so th- I think this is like my mom's favorite book as a kid growing up. So you're named after the crow, and also, which is very strange, is that you played the scarecrow in your high school, right? Then you play the yeah, scarecrow. Yeah, I played the scarecrow, but that, that that's not, those aren't related. They are to me. Yeah. The scarecrow is a scrow. You know, <laughs> they're related. Well, I mean, it, it's kind of weird. Because you're not after a crow. No, the, but the scarecrow is the crow. The crow. It, it's related. It's uh, related. You don't got a blow, because you're out of too smart. You're done as D, <laughs> and you're, uh, you love the donuts, and they both start with D. <laughs> I could tell you why. Stop. Okay, all right. All right. Um, um, <laughs> are you done with this? Cause <laughs> no, I can talk I can talk forever about this movie. Then start talking. Um, what else do we want to talk about? Is there anything that's interesting about it? What, what do you think of it? I already said what I think about it. This isn't my pick. He, he said he already think. Oh, I, I, I picked it for you. He was like, I, I enjoyed it. Then ask me some <laughs> questions. What I thought. Um, uh, I oh. like that they keep poisoning the cat, and yeah, then the, the, keep... the guy's like, "Why are you so sleepy?" Also, that Nim is an insane asylum, right, or a, a medical center? That medical, they, yeah, yeah, National Institute of Mental Health. Yeah. But um, when they say mental health, it's not for like insane people. It's like they're just doing like experiments on experiments animals, on basically. Animals, also, yeah. like cosmetics and stuff. What they do? Cosmetics. <laughs> I think they have like so. This is like the intelligence term that they get. That's the secret, guys. Um, Spoiler. <laughs> Actually, the book is called Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim, if you ever want to read it. What's um, the difference between the book and the movie? No, no, a whole lot. Crow's not his major character. Um, what else changes? Uh, I think that they go into a bit more with the rats, a bit more with Mrs. Frisbee's husband. Um, what else? You could technically look at The Secret of Nim as the apple. What apple? Bible apple. <laughs> I, know, I mean, it gives him yeah, intelligence. It gives him knowing. Yeah. But I mean, Nim was not paradise. Nim was hell. Nim um, was tortured. There is there is a sequel. Don't watch it. It's, it's uh, absolutely good. I terrible. It. A lot of those animated sequels were complete dog shit, especially Disney. And then like they were so bad that like when they realized what they had with the Lion King and stuff, they were like, oh. Oh shit! And they went back and were like, "We got to make the Lion King one point five and make it decent." Like, I can't believe that they literally took the Lion King, which is a beloved <coughs> classic, and they didn't realize what they had, and they made this like sequel, which is like forty five minutes long. You're like, "Have you lost your mind?" Is that the one that takes place? Because there's two Lion King sequels, but I can yeah. Think there's of. the Lion King two, which came out closer to the first one, and then they went back and made Lion King one point five. One point five is when the newer one, which is probably better than two. Well, number two is like Simba's offspring, and uh. And like he meets Scars' aunt or something. I can't remember. And then number number one point five, I think takes place between them both. And it's Obviously. when Simba's in um, exile with Timon and Pumbaa because Timon and Pumbaa aren't in the movie a whole lot. You don't get to see that time of Simba growing. It pretty much does it in a montage and the one song. I am I pretty much like good on Secret of Them unless you have something else to say. What do you want to rate it? I would probably give it an eight point five first time watch. That's it. Yeah, I mean, it was great, but I mean, I don't... It's a first-time watch. You're going to give it 10 out of 10? No, I'm going to give it a 5 out of 5. 5 out of 5, okay. Yeah. Um, next week, I don't know what. Do I do a blind spot and pick one for myself? Do I do You Ain't Seen? Do I do Amicus? Do I do Universal? I kind of want to give you a You Ain't Seen, and I'm torn between giving you a 1970 movie that I think that you should watch because it has Christopher Lee as Dracula, and you saw all the Hammer ones, so I think it would be cool for you to watch Just Franco's Dracula, which is one of Just Franco's best movies, and surprisingly, like a lot of people will give Just Franco a really bad name and say all his movies are cheap as shit, but I think it's well done. Who's the guy that's not Just Franco, but I always confuse? Joe Amato? No. Oh, you fucking confuse Just Franco with James Franco, which yeah. is absurd. Okay. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> but I've always wanted you to watch this movie because you watched the first one, mm-hmm. of course, mm-hmm. and you've never seen The Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2, which I always planned on having you watch, but it's been popping up a lot lately in people's feeds and everything, so I'm like, 
Let's just do the Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2. A uh, quick question. What's the better version? The Scream Factory or the Arrow? Which one has better picture quality, I guess, and sound? Because I have both versions. Oh, Secret and M. To go back on topic. Um, so if that's an MGM. Yeah. Um, and MG- Amazon just bought, bought MGM. All but, of but MGM. But it's probably okay. Because anything pre-1986 didn't get per- picked up i think that oh really i think some other co- i think fox or not fox uh, warner brothers owns it it's it's complicated they it might have been picked up in there but they picked up they own certain movies and not all the movies but anything after a certain year and then they picked up like all the rockies and stuff like that so it, it's it's complicated to go back to don bluth real quick they did get the um aip movies the aip yeah. american international yeah well the stuff something. that you know like has price in it and shit so. oh okay um to pick up back on don bluth real quick because i don't know if we'll watch any more of his um because none of them are any good um all dogs go to heaven it's our dogs go to heaven it's great tale, anastasia's I've great american and i've seen yeah. anastasia too so we've seen them um we, i won't make you watch troll in central park um so every time don bluth makes a movie he, his company falls to shambles because he, he, he's a very independent guy and he still animates he's like in his 90s um so like you have like secret and name and all dogs go to heaven or mgm um and then like towards like like the late 80s early 90s i forget who it is you get to like titan ae and anastasia they're all fox like he just like could not oh it's Warner brothers i think are the earlier or the midsection yeah um so it's like every time he starts to do well like his first two movies are great and then he makes a flop and the companies are like ah we don't want we, we can't do it don so so it's like oh i'll go start my own company again and he, he makes a success and then it flops and so um and i think titan a is his final picture that he directed that he directed he also did um if you guys remember the old arcade games uh dragon is it dragon slayer and space ace I could be wrong on Dragon Slayer. They they were arcade games that were cell animated, and you had to hit buttons at a certain time to make the characters do the stuff. But he he did those as well. Um, Don Bluth is amazing, and he's one of my favorite animators. He owes me God. six bucks. Charles Band owes me like ninety. So <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. I think we're done. We're done. All right. See you guys. Bye. All right, I guess we're going to hop into the question of the week or the update, the, all the questions and answers and all that kind of stuff. Last week, I asked you guys what your favorite movie, horror movie or horror adjacent movie from 1970 was. I got uh, some answers, but Peter Englund messaged me. He said he's been blocked, but his favorite horror from 1970 and soon The Darkness. Um, Ilk Vomit, here's a question here. What do you think happened on Monday going back to school with everyone involved in The Breakfast Club? Do you think they talked to one another or they just walked on by? Oh, it depends on the character, but I think they probably didn't talk to each other. It might have been the awkward kind of head nod, like we're associated, and then, uh, you know what I mean? Like the kind of, yeah, uh, I don't know. I bet they didn't. I bet John Hughes sees it as that was just that one moment in time where they shared some stuff, and they may never share anything else again, but they had that moment, and it's still deeply embedded in their head, and it was personal to them. But I think they probably just kind of nodded and went about their day. I don't think they're best friends any or anything like that. Um. David Scott, uh, it's kind of like if you're walking with, some, like they probably were walking with their friend and they noticed that person looking at them and they kind of made eye contact, but nobody wanted to do the nod because it would outcast their friend, whatever, you know what I mean? Uh, David Scott, great video and every time I watch this segment, ain't you seen, it makes me laugh. The stylist looks right up my alley. I've always enjoyed movies that are centered around a female villain, so I'll have to check that one out. I do believe Nicole Kidman is one of the most versatile actresses. I do love Killing of Sacred Deer and Stoker. She is like fine wine that gets better with age. Don't think I've seen any 1970s movies, so by default... It would be Bird with the Crystal Plumage. Hope to be able to check out some of the others. Question, what would be your top five Nicole Kidman movies or performances? That's tough because, like I said, Nicole Kidman in more recent years has been picking the movies that I'm interested in. So she's on my radar. I've liked what she's done. But a lot of the movies I had seen her with when I was young, they don't read. I don't remember them like off the top of my head, like far and away. Like I remember far and away. I remember liking that movie. I don't remember if it's any good. You know, I just can base it off that. But, oh, the, for just off the top of my head, Destroyer. She's fantastic in Destroyer. That's a very good role. Um, the Others, very good role. Very great role. Killing of a Sacred Deer and Stoker. That's four. Four right off the top of my head are great performances that come right to me. And those are the ones more modern that I've seen and uh, that I appreciate. So I'll go with those. And they're different too. 
Um, so Nick Mula, the best horror film released in nineteen in the year of the Lord nineteen seventy is Tamlin, aka Ballad of Tamlin, directed by Roddy McDowell and starring Ava Gardner. Very psychedelic seventies take on a Scottish ballad, folk horror and drugs. What's not to love? Um, do you enjoy the work of British filmmaker Pete Walker? If so, which of your films do you like most? Here is the biggest blind spot in all my film history. Is Pete Walker. I have his movies. I have seen one. I have seen House of Long Shadows with Sir Christopher Lee. We have Peter Cushing, John Carradine, and of course, Vincent Price. That's the only one I've seen. It's not one of his strong films, from my understanding. I've always wanted to watch his other movies. I bought the box sets that Kino put out, or Redemption. So I'll get to him eventually, which is bad. But um, I, I like House of Long Shadows fine, but that's all I can speak on. Uh, is there any difference between the pervert cards for boys and those for girls? Or are they unisex? Anybody can have a pervert card anywhere, anytime. Except pedophiles. They don't get a pervert card. That's not acceptable. As you change your look every now and again, will Mr. Parker ever embrace the current trend of the ultra-long Viking-style beards and the Japanese man bun? Then you can change your YouTube handle to Sensei Mr. Parker. Absolutely not. A lot of people think I'm like changing my style. Look for Sometimes I'll do it for movies, but a lot of times it's just like, Oh, I didn't get to go to the barber this in the next three months, so I <laughs> that's kind of the thing. Um, I do like keeping it short now as I got older, just because the long, gray, scraggly hair, you just look insane all the time. So not that I really care that much, but I just it's just also like I work in a hot environment, so keeping it short is just better for my sanity. Um, uh, okay, and then Dead Flintstone, The Honeymoon Killers is a great little movie from 1970. Definitely going to watch that. And I know it's Herschel Gordon Lewis, but Wizard of Gore is pretty fun. I don't think I'm going to watch Wizard of Gore again. That would be the third time in like three years. I just can't do it. Sorry. And I, and I, I just know I don't love it that much. Isimicio, that Santa Sangre release is a beast. The stylus is great. Very well done. Some people were complaining about how she didn't have a clear motive. But I think there doesn't need, have to be an explanation or a childhood incident to create a killer. You can tell she's emotionally a wreck, and that's all the proof I need. So I want to comment on that. I would agree. Like, how much do you know about uh, Joe Zito in, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, what's his name in uh, Maniac? Frank. I said Joe Zito, the director's name for Joe Spinell in that. Frank Zito, sorry, in Maniac. You know that he had a bad mother. Same thing with Norman Bates. You you barely know. With the stylist, you sense this, this, um, this longing of wanting to be someone identity she does not have an identity therefore she doesn't know she, she's like stealing this identity this loneliness and identity like all I, I saw it right there like the movie portrays that like she doesn't have this identity like and there's a featurette on that disc that she's invisible like yes that's all you need like it's almost like a, a reach out into society that like i'm unnoticed i'm unwanted and a lot of these killers they want to hurt society that's why somebody like who was it uh edmund uh geez kemper he wanted to kill the young and smart because that would hurt society the most. <laughs> it's just like she seems more of a lonely killer than somebody than a revenge killer. But at the same time, she's attacking these people that have these lives. And she also seems to have a morality streak to her where she doesn't seem to be so much as a killer when in the part of the stylist until the woman says, well, I'm hooking up. You're the only person that knows. Like she's such a. It's not just a morality thing there for her. It's more so she is such an insignificant person to this woman that she can just tell her that she's committing this transgression and it doesn't fucking matter. And that she says that that's just like, oh, what am I invincible? So it is like an act out to society. And the people are like, there's no motive. Use your fucking brain, okay? I'm sorry. Like, what do you want? Everything slathered on a sandwich to you? I'm, I, it's just everything everybody wants to be hand fed shit that's why everybody's movies are three and a half fucking hours long just to explain some guy going to the grocery store and buying a bag of pickles they sell pickles in a bag am i on drugs okay so she continues her statement sorry i got off on a ta tangent there pie Wacket has a gut punch of an ending saint and slave is awesome really love the evolution of the indonesian cinema as of late i feel directors who keep striving and are creative with little resources are the most dedicated i also feel directors who make very personal films are incredibly inspiring as well because it's more than just a cash grab i like raw but not in love with it because i think the general idea was done pretty it was done better with trouble every day minus the veterinarian school setting slip mouth woman sounds like a goofy knockoff of carved haha -ha. I need to give Trouble Every Day a rewatch. 
I didn't love that movie, and I feel like I should have. Ken Coakley. Of course, I would have to say A Bird with the Crystal Plumage. It's one of my favorites of 1970. It was Argento's directorial debut for starters. I also like star Tony Mustante. And Dario didn't, right? Um, he was on two successful TV shows. The first one was a cop show called Toma based on a real cop. Mustante didn't want to do 22 episodes the next year and was replaced by Robert Blake, which caused the real David Toma to demand that the title of the show be changed. That's when Beretta was born. He was also the show uh, on the show Oz, which also featured Italian screen limit Tomas Milan. I remember Thomas Milan on the show. He was um, uh, Alvarez's grandfather, um, and he kind of lost his mind in that. I do not remember um, Tony Mustante. Oh, shit! He's uh, Nino! He's Nino Sh Shibeta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the main mamba. I can't believe that's him. I didn't even register that. It just hit me right there. He's got to be Nino. Yeah, yeah, Shibeta. Um, great. That's awesome. A couple of Sam Shepard produced films came out that I liked a lot. One of them was Horror of Blood Monsters, which used U.S. footage and combined it with the footage from a movie that was made in the Philippines. Even though they're not horror, I would like to give some love to a Western, the Spaghetti Western The Unholy Four, starring Leonard Mann, Peter Martel, George Eastman, and Woody Strode. I'd also love to give honorable mention to the biker film, my favorite subgenre, Angel Unchained, starring Don Stroud, uh, Tom... Tyne Daly, Larry Bishop, and Luke Askew. Um, yeah, uh, I love The Unholy Four. It's fucking awesome. They all escape from the mental institution in the beginning. Is that the one? Good stuff. Good spaghetti western. Biz Cup Bump Horror Reviews. The Killing of a Sacred Deer is one of my favorites from 2017. I was lucky enough to catch it at my local art house theater, and it just blew me away. Especially the scene of Martin eating the spaghetti. Like, damn. Jason Siegel, Wizard of Gore. Can't go wrong with Uncle Herschel. Timothy Matthew Hayes, Assignment Terror. Love the Paul Nashie Wolfman movies. I also love movies that feature monsters from classic horror, universal horror films, Dracula, Frankenstein's Monster, The Mummy, and The Wolfman 2. Um, John Soloway, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and then we correct him. We say 1970, not 1974, and he says, I drink your blood. Um, Daniel Roebuck LaFleur, The Bird with the Crystal Plumage, Colin Stone, I drink your blood, Girly, or Goodbye Gemini. Hard to choose, but drink your bloods out there. Um, yeah, we also got... Uh, Girly I, is one I really want to watch by Freddie Francis. Uh, Good, Goodbye Gemini has been a while since I've seen that one. That's a cool movie for sure. Um, then we have Alan Blayton, The Man Who Haunted Himself, Timothy Matthew Hayes. Is there going to be a video podcast in the horror films from the year 1970? Absolutely. Probably in September. I don't know. Adrian Roberts was the bird with the crystal plumage 69 or 70. I think it was 70. And of course it was. Uh, Ronald Postillo makes a mistake. He says, Scorn Food of the Gods of the Melting Man. All about 1970. Matthew Head, and soon the darkness, Ron Lab, House of Dark Shadows, Bill Cassinelli, Mark of the Devil, Runners Up, Wizard of Gores, Equinox, Count Yorga, House of Dark Shadows, Bird of the Crystal Plumage, and the Bloodthirsty Butchers. Stan Moreland, Mark of the Devil, David Luton, has to be Dario Gentu's stunning, stylish debut, The Bird of the Crystal Plumage, followed by Five Dolls for an August Moon, Hatchet for a Honeymoon, Mark of the Devil, Scars of Dracula, and the Vampire Lovers. Brandon Young, my favorite Giallo period, The Bird of the Crystal Plumage, Jim Werner, Bigfoot. He was sensationalized for years after that movie, and... Jim Warder is actually my second cousin. So, um, Gary Miller, Equinox, Jeff Thompson, House of Dark Shadows, Stanley Isman, I Drink Your Blood is the Way to Go, Rebecca Reinhardt, I Drink Your Blood, Wizard of Gore, Rob Kohinski, The Bird with the Crystal Plumage, and I do believe that was the first Blue Underground release I ever picked up. That was back when I barely had a film to my name. Hello, I hadn't seen it, but I was, was at Best Buy. I was scoping out the movies and I was drawn by the Blue Underground packaging. The fact it was Dario in the 70s is my birth year, so many years later, it's easily one of my favorite horror films. I love it, too. Uh, Ken Meehan, I Drink Your Blood. Brian Ziegler, The Bird with the Crystal Plumage, or I Drink Your Blood. Ralph Brown, The Bird with the Crystal Plumage. Robert Cruz, I'll throw Vampire Lovers into the mix, which is one of my favorites as well. Tony Araro, man, it's tough, but I'll have to go with The Bird over I Drink Your Blood. Matt Pocock, Mark of the Devil. Gabrielle Jouette, I Drink Your Blood. We got some uh, names. Derek B., The Vampire Doll, Japanese, cool movie. Um, Samuel Glass, sorry, that was a fantastic year. Just way too many to choose from. But if I had to choose a sentimental favorite, Bird comes to mind. Not only Argento's direct debut, but I got to see it in the theater. The rating was GP at the time. It became PG later, so I was allowed in. Felt like an adult at 10. Uh, but then basically I kind of uh, asked him some more, and he said uh, that a lot of the what I accessed to were the TV horror movies that year, if those count right now. The only titles I have to give to go, House of Dark Shadows and Count Yorga. Everything else was during the 70s, but not that particular year. Tim Walker, Bird with the Crystal Plumage, Ryan Matthew Ziegler, um, Taste the Blood of Dracula, The Bird, uh, Sam Matt Kelly Mills. Oh, I misread that too. I looked up the list of horror films released in 1970 and hadn't seen a single one. That's rough. Get on that. I had only seen 20, I think. When I started, um, I plan on seeing 70 at least. So I, I'm a little weaker than I should be. 
Uh, Matthew Humphreys, The House to Drip Blood, one of my favorite Amicus anthology films. Bella Donna, The Vampire Lovers of Count Yorga, Aaron Yurvina, The Wizard of Gore, Joe Paxson, I Drink Your Blood, Christopher Bickle, Mark of the Devil, Kim Cosner, Strange Vice of Mrs. Worth, which is 71, and Shiman, Sh Sherman Hurst, Dunwich Whore. So, um, basically, I'm going to ask you guys what the worst movie of 1970 is. The worst horror film or horror Jason film in 1970. I know people, I don't like to be negative, but I might want to dodge some of these ones that are just overall horrible. So, the worst horror film or horror Jason film from 1970. So, let me know, guys. And I guess we're going to hop into that update. Okay, let's hop into this update. First up is a 4K of Mother. Um, this is a Darren Aronofsky film. I, I remember liking this. Um, have not had a chance to rewatch it. So for the price, I figured I'd grab it. It was on sale for like 12 bucks. Uh, then we have Feaster Sunday, which I've not got a chance to watch. I have a little tiny role in this. It also is directed by Brian Papandrea. Stars Dustin Mills, Sadie Tate, Terrence Cover, Some people that I've worked with before, some friends of mine. So yeah, if you're interested, check it out. Um, Rock Bottom Video. It's not Rock Bottom Video anymore. I'll, I'll post a link if you're interested in it. Or you can just look up Brian on Facebook. It will be there, most definitely. Uh, yeah, so if you're interested. I'm Like I said, I didn't get a chance to watch the whole film or anything like that. So... And then we have some stuff from the On Earth sale. Some of this I already had, but I liked the movie so much, I bought a second copy or I picked up a second copy. A couple of them I got sent to review, so I was like, I'd really like to have another copy of this movie. And this is one here, A Record of Sweet Murder. Um, this is a great film. And for the price, I was like, well, I definitely want to back up on this one. If you guys know how to check this movie out, it's really great stuff by the director, No Roy, The Curse. Um, then we have another one that I really liked, an independent movie here called Purgatory Road, which is about a pair of brothers that are like traveling evangelist kind of uh, religious guys, and uh, they got a couple secrets. It's a really good movie, uh, very enjoyable, very southern gothic stuff, good good film. Then we have one by um, Todd Sheets, and I think I had the uh, Kickstarter Blu-ray of this one, House of Forbidden Secrets. So I was like, well, I'd like the Unearthed this too, because for the price, I'm an idiot. I'm going to have double tip. So yeah, uh, Todd Sheets uh, kind of re returned to directing films, and I think this is one of his best for sure. Then we have the two disc of uh, Ryan Nicholson's Gutter Balls. That's right. Uh, this special edition here has a slew of extras on there. Uh, yeah, I've talked about Gutter Balls to death. How many times have I read Gutter Balls in my life? Right, three or four times. But yeah, um, this has like over 40 hours of extras. That is insane. I feel like no one would ever be able to watch that. Uh, but yeah, and then we have Ryan Nicholson's Torched, which is, is like his first film. I don't remember. This is like a short. It's like a rape revenge movie. I I've only seen it the one time and it was pretty impactful. But uh, yeah, I'm sure it's got tons of features on here as well. If you guys never seen Torched, I remember liking it. But yeah, another one from Unearthed. And then we have uh, the last, one of the last here. We have The Hand by um, Oliver Stone starring Michael Caine. Um, you know, I've never seen this one, but I figured, you know, it's kind of the severed limbs killing people. It's, it's, it's a small subgenre. Um, and then last, ooh, London Bridge is falling down. Thankfully, I record the audio separate. So the last is Black Sheep with Chris Farley and David Spade. And I was like, for the price, I haven't watched this movie in years. I've always been a bigger fan of Tommy Boy. I thought Black Sheep was like the weaker Tommy Boy, but weaker Chris Farley is always still good Chris Farley. I love Chris Farley. Grew up with uh, the SNL guys from that time. Um, just watching a lot of skit comedy. And uh, honestly... Still to this day, uh, I know it may be immature to say, but the funniest people to me are still Chris Farley and Norm MacDonald. I can't help it. They just direct uh, correlation to my funny bone. They just have a direct connection to it. Um, yeah, so I love those guys. Anyways, uh, remember, I seen Black Sheep in theaters when I was a kid. Well, I remember seeing that. So anyways, uh, back to the video. Okay, guys, thank you very much for watching. And as always, have a good one. Mm.